My name's Chris, Chris Watson. I run uh, Endor Learn and Develop. And for the last 16 years, uh, we've focused exclusively on behaviourally based learning and development. So, effectively, what we look at is not what people do, but the way that they go about it. In those 16 years, uh, we've picked up some uh, unexpected uh, insights in terms of developing people. Um, and, and, and sort of quite surprising ways uh, that seem to hold up. And I'm going to share just a couple of those, or hopefully eight of those, with your time permitting. Uh, but they're very much things that you'll be able to take away, use, and, and, and put into practice, if, you, if you're that way inclined, uh, within your own workplaces. In terms of the session route, or what's in it for you, I think there's a number of real key deliverables. First of all, uh, anyone a manager here? Okay. Anyone manage people? Fantastic. Anyone ever work with a manager? Okay, yeah, of course. Uh, covered all the bases. Well, you're going to definitively identify the best managers that there are. Okay? Uh, and again, this, this might not sit well with convention. Uh, but we'll give you a, a, a real key insight if in terms of your own... Um, performance if you're aspiring to be a manager, your current performance if you are one, or indeed the effectiveness of the person that's reaching you. We are, sometimes we have a, a number of people from recruitment agencies here. Is anyone here who works in recruitment at all? Fantastic, I have to be very careful then, I'll have to remember this, but uh, I'm going to challenge uh, recruitment pro professionals and indeed managers and anyone that uh, is involved in, in sort of recruitment and selection activities uh, and, and see whether or not you can really be objective. Identify uh, you know, the, the, the best people for a defined role uh, and I'm going to put a big question mark over that as to whether or not that's possible or perhaps whether or not it's worthwhile. We're going to have a look at uh, influencing. So influencing skills whether it be at work or whether it be beyond, you put in the two particular suggestions that I have for you following this very short session, which will probably last between 60 and 70 minutes, uh, and you will categorically be better at influencing others. This is going to uh, really <coughs> challenge conventional wisdom around being creative. Okay? There's a lot of people who feel quite uncomfortable with this notion of creativity, and uh, I'm going to give you some proven tools and techniques to uh, walk away and be more creative in whatever it is that you do. Uh, change is often debilitating for people. Uh, we all know this, and a lot of people don't uh, warm to change. And to uh, share with you who is likely to need most support during times of change. I'm going to give you a preposterous tool to increase your personal productivity. Okay, uh, some novel ways to control uh, and bolster uh, your stress and your resilience levels. And also uh, signpost uh, a, a plethora of other proven, provocative um, and uh, perverse ways uh, to develop not just yourself but uh, other people that you work with. Okay, so quite, quite a big wish list really for, uh, for given the time. Ultimately, if you wanted to sort of put all that together and package it, I think really what we're going to be doing is an exploration of conventional wisdom around developing people. Okay? So we're going to sort of collectively have a look at the best ways to really deliver some results in this area. Um, now, if we are looking at conventional wisdom um, in learning and development, uh, one of the uh, first things that you're supposed to do if you get people engaged and involved. Okay, so this is my ever going, oh God. Um, so we, I think we will do that. Um, but beforehand, I just need you to, uh, any observations you can about this uh, picture of uh, Jessica Ennis? What's, uh, what, what's happening there? What's she doing, would you say? Celebrating. Sorry? Celebrating. Winning. Celebrating, yeah, celebrating, definitely. Winning. 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 Okay, why, 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 why do you say winning? That's what I get from it. Okay, okay, yeah. So, so winning, sort of prize and sense of achievement. Anything else? 
It is like a power pose, definitely. Uh, yeah. In terms of that pose, if we're looking at the physicality of what she's doing, um, how would you describe it to someone who couldn't see? Arms wide. Arms wide, yeah, definitely. Okay, anything else? Strong. Strong, okay, physically strong. Head up. Head up, it's an interesting one actually. If you have a look, well observed, the head's just tilted back a little bit. So it isn't, it isn't so completely upright with the head, but there's actually, there's a head tilted by eyes still to the front, yeah, but it actually pushes out your sort of chest a little bit. Now I'm glad that we've got that defined because your first mission tonight is to replicate that. So what you're going to have to do, you're going to have to stand up, if that's okay, since we are sticking with conventional wisdom. Okay, and I need to get you involved. It's all the all the train the trainer programs I've ever been on to tell you this. Okay, and uh, now what you need to do, you need to sort of as much as you can. Okay, replicate this. The purpose of that exercise will become more apparent as we navigate through the material. Let's take your mind off it and uh, just help you to relax a little bit. Um, and um, I have, for one person in the room, got the ultimate gift. Now, really genuinely, I've got something that they can walk away with that's going to, uh, I hope, stay with them and resonate with them uh, for many years to come. This isn't it. Uh, but if you can imagine, <laughs> instead, but I'm going to give you a holiday in the Bahamas. And this is a, a six months, all, you can see why this isn't the gift, but six all expense paid trip to the Bahamas. Okay, uh, fantastic time you'll have. Um, and uh, there's only one caveat to this, and that is, you are responsible for sourcing and identifying the person that backfills your position. Um, so you've got to find someone uh, to replace you for the six months that you're away. And don't forget as well your personal professional reputation. Um, and, and also, the success of the ongoing success of your role is dependent upon the quality of the person that is appointed to backfill for you for those six months. Otherwise, you can have a great time. So, I want you to think for a moment about your position. Okay, it is, it is unique to you. So, about your role, and I want you to think about the the qualities and the attributes of a peak performer in the role, whatever it is you do, whether you work in logistics, whether you're in HR, whether you're a line manager, whether you work in recruitment, what are the qualities and the attributes of a peak performer of someone that does your job? Now, there's only one other thing to bear in mind, is that you can use an online portal for this. Okay, and this online portal's got everything already populated. It says all about the company that you work for. It says why you're a great employer of choice. It also says all the stuff at the bottom about how to, how to sort of send in the application and all the requirements for, send, for submission. Um, but what you've got to do is you've got to populate the 10 words that best describe the qualities and the attributes of the peak performer. Okay, so you're only allowed 10 words. So I want you to write down the ten words that best describe someone, you know, this person that you're after. What are they, going to, what are they like? What are they going to be able to do? What are these skills or attributes and qualities of a peak performer in role? Now, if you're currently looking for a job, then try to anticipate uh, maybe what the qualities and attributes of a person in that role would be. So, anyone want to um, let me know the type of type of attributes that uh, they've identified? Flexible. Flexible, fantastic. I've got a communicator. Communicator. Approachable. Lovely. Quite self-motivated. Lots of those can do. Can do, yeah, can do actually. Nice. And motivator. Motivator, right, yeah. Mentor. Lovely. Bumble. 
Humble. Okay, great. Innovator. Innovator, yeah. Creativity is nice. Reliable, nice. Confident. Confident. Right. I'm actually going to stop you there, if that's okay. Unless someone's got a real burning one that they know this is this is critical for success, if you like, in my role. This burning one that I haven't managed to share yet. I hate you saying it, but I say objective. <laughs> Objective. Oh, okay. No, I think, uh, I think that's a fantastic uh, uh, aspiration. Can we have a sense of humour? Sense of humour, yeah, definitely. Uh, <coughs> now, I will stop there on that, uh, on that little funny bone. Um, because this is it's, it's a really interesting thing that happens. Um, what you've provided is, is probably uh, an even higher percentage than what normally happens with this exercise. And we've, we've run this as for you know, uh, years and years and years and you always get the same results. And that is this notion that what organisations tend to uh, value initially is not what gets valued as you enter the organisation and you start to work within it, i.e. companies tend to recruit based on technical skills, experience, no evidence knowledge, i.e. qualifications and so forth. And all these things get you to the door and get you in the door, but as soon as you got in the door, actually they kind of become you know, unimportant or far less important. And what becomes important is what do you think? What would you, how would you collectively describe all of these terms? Attributes. They are attributes. What sort of attributes, though? They are behaviourally based, definitely, but more about uh, interpersonal approaches mm -hmm. uh, and in, interpersonal impact, style, yeah, mm -hmm. rather than some of the technical stuff. Because these are the things, if we kind of all know, make the difference. Yeah? It is the way that people go about it, if not necessarily the technical you know, knowledge that they have. And so often you'll see in an organisation where someone is unfortunately put through what's called a magic weekend. And they are without doubt maybe the best operator. And so because of their uh, prowess, their technical insight, their, their knowledge of the particular operating practice, they get promoted... And then on Monday, they're supposed to be, you know, this really effective supervisor, team leader or manager, and that's when all the problems start. Yeah? And it isn't just your exercise that demonstrates this. If we look at one of the most technical environments you could ever imagine, well, let's go for Google, okay? And you look at Google, a fantastic, if you, if you haven't heard of this, look up Project Oxygen. And Project Oxygen has been running now for 10 years, started in 2008, but, uh, and it is evolving as well, the, the original drivers of Project Oxygen were to sort of try and find out what employees valued most in their managers. Again, what people were expecting to see was technical expertise, especially at Google. Yeah? What Google found, though, however, was that technical ability... The defining trait of many Googlers, give the expression, um, actually came in last. And again, it was these type of attributes and qualities that came in first. And in fact, the number one, for anyone interested, was actually coaching. A manager that invests in me and spends time to develop me. Okay. So, that's fine, but that sort of kind of whets your appetite, really, because that's really looking at what we want from a manager. But what do, I mean, being more defined about it, if you could collect, if you keep doing this exercise, could you sort of collate this information and then do something with it? Starting uh, ten years ago, we got a chunk of money uh, from the European Regional Development Fund uh, to work with uh, the Knowledge Transfer Project, uh, with a bit of support from the University of Hull, uh, to actually find out in this country 
what is it that employers value most in their employees? And, and more specifically, really trying to identify the, the adaptive skills that could be uh, transferred into any role, okay, and also any sector. So actually, if we can find what these are, these, this is the ultimate portable vocational success package for anyone. Because once you've got your qualifications, yeah, then what do you do? Yeah? Do you know, uh, how, you know where, where, do you, where do you invest your time and energy to develop yourself, and indeed, if you're a manager, to develop others? Because actually there is, there is some evidence around this that we actually know what those things are. So there was 10 years study with free feedback, and this was really robust. 8,000 organisations from every sector, every industry, from the NHS, North Yorkshire Police, Virgin Media, uh, anyone you can think of. Fisheries, agriculture in Lincolnshire, creative, digital industries. complete sort of um, <coughs> representation and, and we'll share ultimately what those transferable currencies are because we know you know categorically that this is what will resonate with you as soon as you see them you'll think of course more importantly they'll resonate with every employer that you ever were with from now on so worth, worth, uh, worth sort of focusing in on those before we do though in, in that search, I came across some quite unexpected things as well. And what I'm going to share with you for, for the remaining part of this evening is just eight of those unexpected items that came up during the study. Is that okay? The first one, I think, is one of, this is one of my favourite ones, actually. And it's about this myth about a great manager. You know, what are great managers like? What do the great managers do? Can you spot one looking into the whites of their eyes? You know, how do you, how do you differentiate between these two as to who's likely to be the most effective? And I would say, of all the stuff actually, this is probably one of the most valuable uh, things that you can walk away with. And if you had to pay to come today, this would be the one that's worth the price of admission alone. So we're going to have a look at this, uh, this conventional wisdom around great managers can be identified, their talents distilled uh, and then replicated. Okay? The whole of the competency framework, anyone operate with competencies in their organisation, yeah? it's kind of built around this, uh, this particular thing. So, Gallup in the 1990s conducted what was the biggest piece of research to date in terms of what great managers do. Um, so someone interested in uh, developing people, I was fascinated as this was being you know, sort of rolled out and you were getting updates in all the uh, CIPD magazines at the time as to uh, what, how, this, how this was going on and where they were with it. Because I thought, quite selfishly, actually if we capture the results of this, then what we could do we could replicate what great managers look like and what great managers do. And then what we can do is go around all the different sites, all the different depots, and we can upskill each of the managers if it gets this template. Fantastic. It's going to save us you know, loads and loads of work. And as you can see here, the way the methodology employed was that they did behaviourally based interviews. They, first of all, differentiated between adequate managers and really good managers. And the way they did that was, great managers deliver results through people. So they kind of keep two balls up in the air. Very easy just to look after the people and make sure everyone's happy, but the results, as we know, fall off. Conversely, it's also quite easy to be a bit of a, a sergeant major, yeah, and a bit of a taskmaster, or even a fear manager, yeah, but then everyone walks away thinking, you know, and it builds resentments, demotivates people after a long time, and that's unsuccessful as well. So these, what they, it's an American term, and forgive me, these superior managers, that they call them, actually delivered results through people. They focused both on task 
and managed to sort of focus on people simultaneously. Yeah, they kept both balls in the air. And what Gallup did was they interviewed them and they tried to discover if it was that these superior managers did. How did they behave to be able to reconcile sometimes two opposing um, objectives? What they found, though, was quite staggering, and it goes against every competency framework there is in the world. In that, what they found was there were massive differences in their approaches. Okay? What they found was there were differences in the way that they motivated their people, there were differences in the way that they gave them a sense of direction and purpose, there were differences in the way that they led their teams, and even the differences in the way that, say for example, they communicated. Some of these apparently superior managers were still fairly old school and they'd say, you'll not before you come in my office. You know, this is my office, I'm busy. Others were like, Actually, I don't have an office. It's open door. You know, this my space is your space. Let's talk. That doesn't kind of make sense. Yeah? So, ultimately, with the most expensive piece of research in terms of what makes a great manager, it seemed to be that the only thing that they found out was that there was no consistency, if you want, of approach. Okay? That's, that's a very expensive piece of research and they've gone through 120,000 hours of behaviourally based interviews to discover ultimately very, very little. Or is it? I mean, for me, actually that's quite refreshing. Because what that is saying is that there isn't one way to manage. There isn't a template if you follow. There isn't a shape and, you know, who hasn't been there? Scottish and Newcastle were definitely there for quite a while where you know, what you need to be if you, is, you know, this bit about motivation, you know, you need to be this level of communication, you need to be, in terms of providing direction, you need to be here, you need to be, yeah, you're here at the moment, so we need to increase your ability to do that, and in terms of, uh, you know, assertiveness, you know, you, you need to be here. <coughs> and it's still an awful lot of companies operating around this particular paradigm, and it is flawed. That's all, all, all I'm going to say about that. However, there's one extra piece here. That's it. Gallup were just about to close the book on all this research. And they were about to close the book, and a researcher noticed, actually, that there did seem to be a pattern emerging. Something that, with all of the superior managers, was it bled into their responses and bled into the words that they were using and was absent with the managers that are either just great at keeping people happy or great at delivering task on time in full. So, what do you think it is? Integrity. Integrity, I think it's important. I think, and I, don't, don't get me wrong, it doesn't mean to say that you know, being able to motivate isn't important either. Or, or, you know, provide a sense of direction, critical, all of those, but they are the, the, the differentiator. Preferred also? Well, you're, you're sort of moving closer now because certainly the notion, something around communication is, is, is definitely key. Or light. Not necessarily, actually. They were, no, it wasn't. Um, they, they were respected, uh, but not necessarily light. And I think there is a critical difference there. Compassion. Sorry? Compassion. Compassionate, sort of tender hearted. Mm. You seem lovely. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, not necessarily. Not necessarily. It's linked to communication, it definitely linked to listening. What they found was looking through, and uh, about to close the book is that what these great managers did, and they weren't even aware of it, is that when they were talking about how they approached things, they used the word individualise a lot. So they treated their people as individuals, and what they did was, they realised when they were motivating the two of you, and forgive me, sort of lumping it together, but um, actually when I'm sat down with you explaining if you like, the challenge of the next sales targets, 
do it in a completely different way to capture and engage you than I will for yourself. Um, because I've got you know, that, you know, enough nouns to recognise that people aren't homogenous, as indeed managers aren't. So, bear that in mind moving forward, that actually the differentiator of great managers often is quite simple, and it is about this, this recognition of the importance of individualising. Um, if ever you want to see more about that, have a look at a book called First Break All the Rules by Marcus Buckingham. Uh, fantastic, and it, it goes into much more detail. Myth two. Around, it is possible to be objective, and it is possible to be uh, rational, and we're all capable of making informed decisions. And we certainly think, yes, you know, definitely, I mean, I pride myself on that ability to do so. I think recruitment, if we look at recruitment, uh, has got uh, a lot more uh, evidence-based in the last sort of 30 years. Uh, people look for, you know, score sheets, to identify the behavioural priorities for the role, uh, and then what you do is you, you compare evidence against a question battery uh, built around the requirements of the role. Yeah? Uh, and then what you do is you tot up the scores, and then, assuming they've met the minimum criteria, you can differentiate between uh, a number of able candidates. Okay, that's the way, that's the way that ha happens quite often. Um, however, um, people have lost sight of some research uh, that you will know about, but you will never have picked up where it comes from. And that is research by uh, Douglas Mackenzie Davy, who was an occupational psychologist um, who died fairly recently. There was, a, there was a lovely, lovely obituary, half page in the Independent about him, about what a genuinely lovely guy this, this chap was, uh, liked by everyone that met him. Uh, and he is uh, unknowingly famous um, for a piece of research that you will know of. And what that was, in the late 70s, we saw the rise of competency based interviewing. Competency-based interviewing is what I've just described, whereby you look at the competencies for the role, uh, you, you sort of uh, assess people against uh, those role requirements, and then you come to an objective decision uh, based on the results of that interview. And he thought, right, what I'm going to do, just check that actually this is worthwhile, I'm going to get the best in class. And so he, he worked with some senior headhunters, really experienced in their field, I bet they really were best in class. He got a handful of these uh, skilled recruiters, all being trained in CBI, competency-based interviewing, and he said, one thing for me in the next week, when you're doing your thing, okay, when you're interviewing and you're recruiting, and ultimately, hopefully, you're going to appoint, um, can you just keep this little pad uh, by your notes? And all the pad had was three boxes. And what he asked them to do, in the first two minutes, when they first meet someone, and they sit down and they welcome them in, hi, oh, nice to meet you, and, uh, you know, just a ticker across as to whether or not you think, actually, I think this is going, going to go really well. I think this will be, yeah, this could be look sharp. Yeah, nice glasses. A bit of personality with the socks. Yeah, I like that. So, uh, yeah. I can, I can see it's going on well. Then do your thing. Okay? What we want to do is then go into your probing questions. Then start to isolate if your behavioural characteristics and how this person's likely to respond. Halfway through the interview, can you just do a, another, either a tick or a cross if it's not going as well as you thought? And then once the interview's over and you've collected all your data and then you've made your objective assessment, okay? So it's a bit more disappointing than I thought, actually. I've got high hopes. So, yeah, it looked, looked like it was going to be good. You'll, you'll be able to empathise with this, Jonathan. But ultimately, once, 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 yeah, yeah. once we've done a bit of probing, it just didn't work out. So, across. Okay. And he got, he got all of them to do it. They, they did over 100 of these for the senior roles. And the results were quite surprising. I think... Gut feeling was right. Gut feeling was right. That's, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> so, so actually our, our intuition, so actually I don't need to interview, I should have been able to tell that 
is Carl. Carl, a bit of a duffer. <laughs> <laughs> my, my instinct should have told me. Well, here are the results. Okay. And this, this is staggering. This is really, really interesting and it affects much more than just work. This is a representative sample, about 10% of all the results that week. Okay, from the best in class, the best interviewers that are out there. Any observations now? Because, picking up on, I think it's a fair point, both of yours, sometimes, if, if the interviewer thought it was going to go well, it didn't always. Yeah? There are variations. Sometimes you start off as if, ooh, I'm not sure. Yeah? Although, actually, it's picked up. So what's, what's your thoughts now? Bingo. And this is, this is a little bit different because what seems to happen is if we like what we see, what we tend to do is leave our mind open for positive and negative evidence. If it started with a cross, before you've collected any evidence, 100% of the time, it ended with a cross. And this is where, and it has, it has sort of bled into everyday language, statements like, oh, you know, they always say in the first two minutes you make up your mind, but this is actually where it comes from. Now, there's massive consequences for this, obviously. There's consequences about people you don't get on with at work. Because what, what Douglas Mackenzie Davy says, is that what seems to happen is, when something, you know, we see something we like, we keep our mind open for, you know, we might still end up disliking them, yeah, or not going ahead with them or not being positively influenced by them, but it is an open situation. When we dislike or we're sort of thinking this isn't going to go well, what we tend to do is we look for evidence to reinforce our original thoughts. Even if the evidence is exactly the same as the person that's just been offered a job that was sat here ten minutes ago. Yeah? Why, though? This is what's more interesting than why. Why does that, why does that phenomenon happen? Because this is why it's so hard to change, and it doesn't matter how scientific you try and be, you, this is what you've got to really challenge. It is kind of, yeah. Actually... All I'm, what I'm throwing into the mix here, all my experience and the skills as a professional, top, top draw, competency-based interviewer, yeah, and I, I headhunt for some of the biggest companies in the world, yeah, so if I keep doing this, no good, yeah, no good, uh, all right, oh, oh, actually, tick, mentally, and I consistently do another one, oh, Oh, actually, they ended up being quite good. What am I saying about my own abilities and skills as an interviewer? Yeah, or my ability to read people, or my sense of you know my intuition and my 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 ability to sort of uh, draw you know what's going on. So you're not likely because what you have to do to make this a tick. Evidence aside, is you have to say, you're not very good at this, especially if you keep having to do that. So for convenience and to keep your sense of identity intact and self-esteem, you never do. And you'll think it can't be that, but that, that's the hypothesis anyway. Bear in mind with people that you work with, that when they first came in, you didn't, you know, something about them didn't, didn't gel with or whatever, because you're, you're on the hunt for more evidence to prove that you're right about them. Okay, myth three, these ones are shorter, you'll be pleased to hear. Be the strongest link. This is about, if you like, be dispassionate. There's a big thing about influence. If you're negotiating with people, what you need to be, if you're quite, uh, keep your poker face, you've heard that one. Yeah, don't give anything away. Put on negotiation here. Yeah, so you, you know, just, <laughs> One of the toughest arenas for negotiation is actually art negotiation. And the reason for that is you know, the, the, the scale and the, the money is involved 
again, it pulls in if you're very, very skillful and experienced negotiators. So, interesting study of art negotiations. Towards the end of the negotiations, the seller made the final offer one of two ways. First way, in a fairly straightforward way, half the time they said, right, okay, and here is my final offer, I will accept 14.2 million. Second version, they said, I'll accept 14.2 million, but I'll also throw in my pet frog. Consistently, participants who were also offered the bonus of the pet frog were more likely to accept the offer. Why do you think? Because they're getting some free they think they're getting some free Do you think they really frog. thought they were going to get a frog? It's, it's, it's being human, isn't it? It's actually just, you know, it's, it's, it's good, it's good, it's good to demonstrate that, you know, you're, you're not dispassionate, you know, robot, if you, that's inflexible. <laughs> yeah? And uh, if we stick with dispassionate people uh, for a, a short moment, we'll have a look at um, uh, Anne Robinson. <laughs> Um, and uh, everyone's seen this, the weakest link, so you'll, you'll, you'll know this. Uh, effectively, for anyone that hasn't, so you've got nine people, um, and uh, they take it in turns to answer questions, and ultimately they, they decide who they're going to nominate, if you'll uh, vote, ultimately vote out, until it comes down to one person being, being left. There was a study of the 1,400 episodes that have taken place of the weakest link, uh, and really it was, a, it was an investigation into uh, influence and whether or not other things are at work beyond your personal capabilities. Okay? And this shouldn't happen either, but it does. What tends to happen is, and think about this next time you go into a meeting, bear in mind where you sit. Because this chap here is about five times as likely to win the show regardless of his intellect, abilities or knowledge base because of where he's positioned. Okay? And uh, I will just check on this for in terms of the stats, but uh, people who occupy, and this is on an ongoing analysis of the 1400 editions of the show, People who occupied that central position got through to the final 42% of the time and actually won the show or after they got through 45% of the time. Now, it should be entirely random because it should be each person if you're voting different individuals out. So that, that shouldn't hold up. Additionally, if you're on an extreme peripheral <coughs> position, so actually there's someone here, you with someone here, on the extreme peripheral positions, you will get through, so you'll influence positively the rest of the group 17% of the time, and you'll actually get through to the final 10% of the time. And that shouldn't happen either. It should be an even distribution, because people aren't positioned there because of their intellect, their IQ, or their knowledge base. It's entirely random. So that shouldn't happen either. So, if at work you have... Board meetings, if you have meetings where, who doesn't hate a good meeting, but you know, you're sort of sat there, if you like, waiting to have your turn and say that important thing to try to get some extra support for your, your department. Or then, actually, a simple way to give yourself a head start is sit in the centre of whether it be the arc or where you know, the sort of position is in that meeting context. Next one. Be calm like Zen. If uh, you're into creativity, there is a bit of a myth here that what you need to do, you need to be completely relaxed to, to really engage with all that creative thought that's there. Yeah, to, to get your body relaxed, get your mind relaxed, yeah, calm, chill out. And then what will happen rather magically, yeah, all these new thoughts will enter your brain. If you like. It doesn't always work like that, though, in terms of creativity. Um, and we're going to uh, try to put you under a little bit of duress 
to try and demonstrate that. Okay, just to sort of add a, a frisson of excitement as well. Uh, there is going to be a prize for this. Okay, uh, it isn't the Barbados holiday, but <laughs> I, 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 and I'll explain why. I absolutely, a hundred percent, believe this is better than the Barbados holiday. <laughs> And I, I, I actually do, do mean that as well. Uh, and so one lucky person is going to win something that I think is, is dynamite and that uh, will make a, a, a long-term difference to them in whatever their job is. So how's that for a sale? Um, but to get that fantastic prize, what you're going to do, you are going to be in a competition very short competition, I'd imagine it's going to last about 90 seconds, maybe a couple of minutes. Okay, it's worth engaging with and it's worth uh, yielding your mind and, 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 and putting as much effort into this as you can because one person is going to win that. Okay. So, what have you got to do? In front of you, there is a handout sheet called Powerful Patterns. Okay, don't start it yet, so I want to uh, just highlight what you've got to do. What you have to do is pair things up. Pattern recognition is, is a real key aspect of creativity. So here, for example, once the, uh, the klaxon, the metaphorical klaxon goes off, what you've got to do is, I've paired up a lion, and don't use this, that's not creative, uh, a lion and a shark, okay, and I've put them here, so I've crossed them out and I've written them in the pairings box. And my rationale in my mind, so you've got to have a rationale, is that they're both a bit scary. Does that make sense? So I can justify that's why I've paired those up. And you might pair up other things, and as long as you've got a sensible rationale, yeah, doesn't, doesn't matter what that is, then you will populate until you get down to the final pair there. And that's all you've got to do. However, it's going to be competitive situation. So when you have finished, the first person to finish, I want you to shout out with your name. Is that okay? Of course you can. Well, if there are 21, mm -hmm. then you can't leave any out, so that's not even preparing. It's not well done. It's sort of a, a mathematician amongst us. <laughs> there is a little box, uh, I, I seem to remember, at the bottom for anything that wasn't, yeah. wasn't sort of uh, knowledge. But okay. uh, yeah, so you might want to use that. So, on your marks, get set, go! But Heidi, um, tell, me, uh, tell me about you, you did amazingly well. How did you find that exercise? Um, interesting, I tried to think rationally but outside of the box as well. Okay, okay, interesting. And would you say um, you were more or less creative um, as this exercise went on? Um, probably more. Anyone else notice that sort of, um, that, that sort of effect that actually when you start struggling, you've only got a few left, that can be when you're at your most resourceful rather than your least resourceful. We, we have about 60,000 thoughts every day. The challenge is most of them are the same every day. It's lovely to think, oh, we have 60,000 thoughts a day, but most of them are the same 60,000 as we had the day before. Very often what you need is agitation to actually push you to think slightly differently. And even time pressure. Time pressure, all the books will tell you on creativity, that actually you shouldn't put, pe shouldn't put people in a competitive situation, you shouldn't put them under duress, and you shouldn't put them... Uh, in a situation where it's, you know, it's timed and they're, they're fighting against each other. That, yeah, so all of those are the worst things you can do with creativity. That doesn't hold up. And similarly, so thank you Heidi. What about this? Uh, a little bit of Shakespeare for you now. I'm throwing all sorts into this smorgasbord, aren't I? But um, uh, which is easiest to read? Quickly, what do you think? Top, top, one. top one. It is, isn't it? Nice, simple, clean <coughs> font. Yeah? And then we've got uh, I think Brush uh, Script, and then the advertising agency's pet hates Comic Sans. It's a, it's a, it's a monster, Comic Sans. It's a, it's a, a, a real horror. Um, but uh, So the first one would be the one that you'd do, if you like, if you were going to do handouts for people. Yeah? 
or if you're going to give to young children uh, to help them learn something and then check the learning has taken place. Makes sense. Sometimes it's the thing about agitation and making things harder for people holds up in all different ways. There was a brilliant study and it's so, so compelling and it's been replicated many times. And what they did with school children, they changed all the handouts, the fonts on handouts for school children to, uh, to fonts that are really difficult to read. And what they found was the children with the difficult to read fonts cons consistently did better and performed better and outperformed all the children where the work was easier to read. Sometimes making things harder for people is useful. You have to invest more, and by investing more and having to focus more, it actually leads to better retention rates. Now, there is a limit, there is a sort of ceiling on that effect. What I'm saying here is that sometimes agitation, you know, it gets bad press, but can be used very, very positively. This is a real nice quick one about change. Um, so, uh, there's, a, there's a myth anyway with change saying that people don't like change. My experience is people don't mind change, they don't like being changed. Yeah? So, and that's, that's to do with volition and a willingness. Yeah? You think of a new car, Caribbean holiday, um, maybe. Unexpected gift. Um, safe for you there, by the way. Um, and uh, all of these things are change. Yeah, Christmas presents. They're, they're all. They're all. Change, they're all sort of different innovations in life. Yeah, but we're quite happy with those. But sometimes organisational change feels like it is imposed on us, and often is imposed on us. And so it's much harder to engage people. There is evidence, though but it's actually much harder to engage certain categories of people rather than others. Okay? You might have seen that yourselves, and you might be one of them, and it's not, it's not a problem, but it is useful to be able to identify where you might need to invest extra support, or indeed, if you're this particular type of person, it will give you some understanding as to why maybe you, you, you know, sort of slur on the uptake or sometimes resist it mentally a little bit before you eventually come on board with whatever that initiative is. Uh, in terms of psychology, here are the big five. Which group, by a long way, are the ones who demonstrate a change-resistant personality? Neurotic. Neurotic, that makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Essentially, like the way things go. Even more so, yeah. And it is all consistently conscious. If you're a perfectionist, you're in trouble. <laughs> because perfectionism, in addition to often being a, a subliminal procrastination technique, yeah, it is, is also about control. It's about self-control. It's about that exactingness and about getting it right. And, and that's not to diss either being conscientious or being a perfectionist, but it's saying there are, are consequences and be aware of it. So sometimes people that you wouldn't expect, because they're so loyal and they're so good and they're so careful, you think, well, they're bound to be on board with this, and they're more, most likely to be right at the back of that emotional engagement. And it's to do with this, with the myth that we live in a, a sort of a consistent world, if you like, and we're surrounded by consistency and surrounded by things that we control. But you have a look at a dripping tap, you have a look at the British weather, uh, you have a look at um, you know, the shape of a snowflake. All these, all these facets of, you know, the natural world are not consistent, they're not uniform. And the interesting thing is, neither is the human condition either. And once actually you, you sort of get your head around that, it's quite liberating to think that we are an atypical system 
operating in an atypical world. And one of the things that uh, has, has, has sort of driven this increasing awareness of this is actually how we look at the human uh, physiological state uh, and how we measure health. Because for years and years and years, we've measured health with this. What, what do you think this is? What does it look at? Heart rate. Yeah, your heart rate. One of the first things a doctor will do, and they would well, put you on a monitor, and then there would be some judgments made. Usually, a healthy person uh, in a resting state would be about 60 to 90 beats per minute. However, recently, medical science has moved on. And what they're more interested in is not the heart beats or the number of beats per minute as a measure, but the interbeat rate instead. Anyone know about the interbeat rate? What do you think an interbeat rate is? Absolutely. And whilst there might be this measure of um, consistency in terms of the number of beats per minute and being a real, real sort of um, clumsy indicator of health, the interbeat rate is completely different. The interbeat rate is very variable, except in certain situations. Because we're a varied organism. If your interbeat rate is really, really consistent, doctors would be worried. Because people who are really stressed and people with a, a high potential for chronic heart disease and this is where you're trying to control your own physiology, have a very consistent interbeat rate. Very healthy people yeah, have a really varied and atypical interbeat rate because we're not a consistent organism. Yeah? Depressed people, what happens is that variability narrows and narrows and it becomes more consistent. And then when they're hopefully out of depression, that variability comes back. Um, the time that you have the, the most uh, natural interbeat rate and the most varied is during REM sleep. Yeah, because you're, you're most relaxed and less as well. But as soon as you start con trying to control your physiology and your, your physical state, that's when it puts pressures both on your heart and on the rest of your physical system. So, the point that I was trying to make here not to give you a biology lesson or what's happening with um, a sort of a medical profession, but it's just to get away from this notion of about trying to sort of control and self-control, and that's ever a good thing, because I mentioned we are a, you know, a varied organism operating in a varied world. Next one, real quick, we're heading toward, hurtling towards the gift-giving ceremony for Heidi, so you know, palpable tension now in the room. Um, but uh, can see in a mentality. So this thing about time is finite. So there's obviously some truth in the fact that that is finite. However, what we can manage is maybe how we respond to it. And that might be really significant as well. There are two ways that you can respond to time. Okay. And you're, you, you will have your own preferred way. And there's no, there's no um, better and no worse with this. Some of us will operate on clock time. Some of us will operate on event time. Anyone know anything about clock and event time? No? Okay, that's good. Well, you might recognise yourself in one of these. Say, for example, if you've got uh, a day off tomorrow, and you'll wake up and you think, yeah, yeah, I've got a day off, you might think, right, what am I going to do with the day? Um, so, event time people might think, well, kind of, you know, I'll do that, and I'll maybe then go there, and I might do that. Yeah? Other people might think, okay, well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go that I, I want to be back for 11 though because I've got a couple of phone calls and chase that up then this afternoon I'll have a bit of lunch and then early afternoon I don't know sort of 1 1 30 I'm going to go over and see uh, that chap in Bradford and we'll have a good old chat about things but I've got to be back so I've got to take this at five o'clock and then we've got to uh, we've got the running uh, that he's involved with. Do you 
we tend to sort of measure activities in terms of little slots throughout the day, yeah, and little times, a little time scale that you're operating by, or is it more varied and you tend to sort of more, you know, go and see what happens and it's, it's less fixed. And there is a little diagnostic that you can um, use to look at your preference between these two, uh, and I can share that with you as well. However, the point is that actually there are consequences of this. Uh, it's been discovered that the more you are driven by clock time, the less likely you will become to take hold and grab hold uh, of exploding opportunities, new things that arise. Um, if that Caribbean holiday if you're offered, um, it's more likely <coughs> event time people are more inclined to take advantage of it than clock time because it's much harder for them to make all the arrangements and get the time off and make it available and because these things become a bit more wedded in their organisation structure. Does that, does that make sense? So that's one thing about clock time uh, and event time. What's even more interesting though is this, about how that impacts on performance. Even whether your clock or event time orientated. Anyone heard of Bikram? Hot yoga. Hot yoga. Hideous experience for, for anyone that's uh, not tried it, but uh, essentially what you'll do, uh, you'll be in a, a room uh, probably a lot smaller than this, uh, with a number of other sweaty bodies, uh, in a room heated to 40 degrees, okay, and then you'll go through uh, two sessions uh, of 26 exercises, quite challenging yoga exercises or positions, uh, and so quite, quite a, an interesting group to study. And what they did was uh, they made uh, just uh, one difference to a room full of mixed event and clock time participants. And that difference was they took out the clock in one group and they left it in, in the other. Okay, what do you think happened? The clock watching that they performed better. Yeah, I mean, casino mentality is this notion that the one thing you won't see in a casino is, is obviously a clock, because they don't want you clock watching. But there's, some, there's, a, there's a more serious uh, point to that, and that is, actually, by being externally referenced, yeah, it's harder for you in any type of activity or, or um, task that you're undertaking. Now that's interesting because if you know, anyone knows anything about HR and the development of things like Taylorism and, and task management and piecework and all these things that we've built uh, conventional work practices around, says so that actually you might get more from people if you remove those clocks. And what happens in this and other uh, situations is that in the, in the Bikram, the hot yoga, People have about 30, go about 30% longer in terms of the series of postures and exercises than they do uh, if they've got a clock. And it's to do with thinking about, and beyond tonight as well, are you internally or externally referenced? And it is better for you, in terms of performance, to be uh, uh, internally referenced rather than externally referenced. Also, just uh, to remember as well that it didn't matter whether or not you were a clock or an event time person to start with. The effect was the same. And they swapped the groups over as well, and, they did, and the same results um, were, were, were reached. Penultimate one now. Uh, the, con the congruence conundrum. Really topical at the moment. There's lots of noise around this. The second most popular TED talk on YouTube, uh, with I think it's uh, 45 million views, is all around this subject. By anyone seen it? By Amy Cuddy. Uh, if you haven't got to see it, fantastic. Amy Cuddy. So click away on YouTube. We know that non-verbal behaviour 
can govern how others think about it. That whole thing, yeah, you, you managed to sort of guess how that person was thinking when it was Je Jessica Ennis. What's coming through now, though, is that perhaps it works the other way around. Your body and your mind absolutely seek congruence. Is it possible by manipulating that, if the body and the mind seek congruence all the time, if we do that, even if I'm not feeling particularly powerful at the moment, could that make me more powerful? Does that make sense? Could that influence my mental state? If my mental state influences my physical state, can you deliberately swap it the other way around? Lots of interesting research about this at the moment. This is what Amy Cuddy did. Uh, in, uh, she's a Harvard professor, and she wanted to look into whether or not you could actually manipulate. It's almost not fake it till you make it, but fake it until you become it. What Amy Cuddy's research was, was to take undergraduates, okay, and for two minutes get a lot of them to do high power poses like this. Yeah, sort of pose, dominant poses, and then measure three areas, and big group as well, do low power poses for just two minutes. Now, business leaders, entrepreneurs, and very successful people, if you profile them, they tend to have higher levels of assertion, they tend to take more risks. Uh, and they tend to be more stress resilient. Now they're all pretty nice things to be able to do, aren't they? Okay. Yeah, you think? I like to. I like to sort of. It's a magic formula to be more stress resilient, to be more assertive, more confident, <coughs> and also to be able to sort of sometimes take more, you know, measured and knowing risks. I think all of us would agree to that. Well. What Amy Cuddy did was have a look at people's appetite for risk after just 120 seconds of occupying either high power or low power positions. Okay? Nothing else. High power, 86% of them were prepared to take risks compared to 60% in the low power But Something was happening after just 120 seconds. She also took saliva readings, so you cannot fake this. Saliva readings from everyone and compared those. Test and looked at <coughs> testosterone change. Well, what happens here? So this is to do with, with that dominance, about that assertiveness, about being more confident, about being more powerful. Okay? And there's a third, there was a 30% variation between the people who occupied high power and the ones that occupied low power uh, postures. Now you can check, you've got complete control over this. So imagine that, you can choose in 120 seconds to have physiological changes in your body, if you decide to do so. Most staggering of all is about stress. And there's lots about resilience at the moment. You can, you can make a fairly decent living just going around doing resilience training uh, in, particularly in higher education uh, and in schools and in the public sector. And resilience trainings are quite, quite interesting. I think people are really warm to it because everyone wants to be more effective in what they do and you know, last longer and, uh, and not get as stressed out because it bleeds into our home. It's quite a, ethically, it's quite a nice thing, I think, to be able to support people with. But surely this can't make a difference to stress levels. This was one of the most significant results of all when uh, Cuddy had a look again from the saliva samples of uh, the, or all of the graduates um, looking at whether or not cortisol was present and cortisol was present at times of stress. And what happened was cortisol changes, high power, cortisol dropped by 25% after don't forget, 120 seconds and in the low power, stress went up. So if you're wrapping your body up like this, actually there might be more than just the consequences of other people thinking, well, they're a bit closed. You actually might be doing yourself some short-term uh, harm as well. Okay, that's a 40% variation 
after 120 seconds. That's staggering. What I will say, do have a look at Amy Cuddy's uh, TED Talk. Uh, if you're interested in this sort of thing, it's very accessible. Um, and it, it will give you some more of the background to it. Um, it has been um, criticised for, she's been criticised for the methodology and small sample size. Um, and for the, in the last couple of years, it's been really uh, hauled over the co coals for some of her scientific methodology. So this year, um, she's come back and defended everything brilliantly. And there's a massive piece in Forbes about it. It really all holds up now to scientific rigour. Additionally, what it's done, it's led to all sorts of other stories <coughs> about this, about the importance of actually managing yourself, managing your physiology, managing the impact that you have through your physical presence, and the fact that actually it very much looks like our bodies can change our minds. Now, if our bodies can change our minds, our minds can change our behaviour, and our behaviour changes the outcomes that we get. So this is, you know, this is as big an opportunity as there ever is. And there's loads since it. This has opened the floodgates in this exciting area. Two groups uh, spend three minutes sitting upright, straight, or slumping down, maybe comfortably, uh, and then asked to do a maths test, so some sort of objective indicator, and also assess their mood. Those who sat upright, so you're talking here 180 seconds, were consistently happier than those who slouched down and obtained higher scores in the maths test. Choice is up to you. Similarly, you might have heard this one. Anyone know anything about this? On your way home then, try it out. Okay? Force yourself into a Dutch end smile. And all you need to do for that is get a pen, if you've got one in your car, use your teeth, okay? And you have to about it, and it forces you to uh, into a smile. Why, why, why might I be suggesting that? Do you think? Doesn't it release uh, happy hormones? It does. It does. It actually releases sort of happy hormones, and after 20 minutes, you will feel happier. One really interesting one that's coming through at the moment is a study of people who have Botox. It's been discovered people who have a lot of Botox tend to have lower incidence of uh, anger. Why do you think that is? It is because they can't express anger in their face. Actually, then what's happening is the mind and the body see congruence. They're actually a, you know, they're, they're less inclined to express and articulate and be angry. So there's loads of stuff, lots and lots on this interesting area. We've looked at though, I'm just pulling it together now. Um, we looked at management, one tiny thing, and these are all things from this original study. We've looked at decision making, influence, how to be innovative and creative, about results focus, even how to build up personal resilience. The only thing that we haven't done really is about ultimately about developing others. Uh, and I've got just one final thing around sort of developing others and developing both yourself and anyone that you work with. And for me, this is, again, the most, uh, I think the most exciting if you work in learning and development. And I hear a lot of the time that unless you're in a big company, you know, where do you start, really, in terms of sort of developing people? We haven't got a big budget, Chris, for, you know, investing in, uh, you know, sort of extending the performance and capability uh, levels of, of the people that work for us. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really, really hard unless you are in a PLC or something. Um, but back to that original study, this should give some indicators. Because what this found was there are 21 themes, 21 key areas that will add value to anyone regardless of where they are in an organisation structurally or what their role is. Furthermore... These 21 are so consistent that all employers are saying, this is what we value in our employees. So you're kind of speaking the language that they want. Um, that these 21 uh, are associated with successful outcomes at work. 
So if you're wondering where should I invest my energy, where should I invest my time, and what's going to give me some transferable skills that are not just useful in my current job, but actually maybe in five jobs time and I might be working in a completely different sector, hands down, these are them. First sight could look like a competency framework, really, but it's not because what it's saying is, regardless of where you are, what your role is, these 21 themes will offer you long term value. Yeah? And instead of being prescriptive and saying a manager needs to be this particular shape, that's nonsense. The speed of change these days is so fast that people moving from project to project, job to job, task to task, that it makes much more sense than saying, as a sales manager, you need this skill, this skill, this skill, and this skill, and then try and squeeze someone into uh, an arbitrary profile and just keep hammering in them into that shape. Which seems madness to me. Instead, you look at the particular project or the particular task that they're needing to get involved with, isolate what are the skills based on those 21 that they need and then find quick and effective ways to develop them in those and then move on based on the requirements of the next job. Because each person is different. All of the results of this have been compiled in a single volume. Uh, we've looked at just eight themes today, eight particular ideas <coughs> to develop that you can pick up and use immediately. Inside Upskill, there are 840. It's a new book, so it's right up to date in terms of things that you can do, practical ideas to extend performance. <coughs> Um, every single one of them can be introduced by each person rather than requiring any additional budget or any additional outside support. They're all perfectly manageable. They're all proven. Some of them might be perverse or provocative, um, but they all hold up and reflect the latest thinking in terms of how to get the best from yourself and from others. So the book's got 840 practical ideas reflecting the latest thinking on how to extend capability and commitment in the workplace. It's based on that 10-year study. What it does ultimately, it delivers a dynamic snapshot of learning possibilities because actually you pick it up and if you needed to <coughs> get better at constructive communication, which is one of the skills, because you know actually you don't normally have to do this in your job but there's now a project where you're going to need to do it there will be 40 practical ideas that you can own manage and introduce that will make a tangible difference to your constructive communication skills so it's a sort of resource of reliable solutions to help you adapt and change to new approaches and work methods they're all relevant and achievable and they're all linked to job requirements because we know this is what employers are saying that they actually need most from their staff. So it puts you in control. So it's very much aligned to self-directed learners 
uh, rather than having to rely on outside agencies. It's the number one HR and training book uh, on Amazon, and it's also been the number one business reference book uh, in this last quarter uh, on the Amazon bestsellers. And I, I hope it's because it helps people manage their own learning. In terms of the type of things in there, there are some quotes, there are practical tools, there are areas of inspiration, so there are books, there are resources, there are pointers to the best TED Talks, uh, there are downloadable apps, there are you know, anything that you'll need in terms of, sort of managing learning and de development provision for yourself uh, or for others. So, back to Heidi. <laughs> Guess what Heidi's won? <laughs> well done, Heidi. Thank you. That, you. that was worth it then, thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you to you. Any questions about, uh, it's been a, a breakneck sort of tour of just, as I say, eight of, of, sort of the uh, 840 that are in there, just to give you a flavour of um, how you really can take charge of your own professional development without... Uh, a big budget or a big HR or L&D team behind you. Just with the, uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts around the idea of Gallup, and obviously done all that research that effectively found that nothing mattered apart from that individual piece, but they're quite big on the cliff and strengths thing, which is the sort of the groundwork and the foundation for a lot of strengths profiles across businesses. Yeah. Is that all a fallacy then? Is that like a that's a really good question. Is that a money-making exercise for them and their consultants because they've already proven they need enough? Well, I think there's two things there. First of all, I don't, I don't think they prove that it, it means nothing. There's obviously merit in being a, an effective team player. There's merit in um, being you know, sort of highly motivational. There's merit in, in some roles, being able to influence others. What they were saying with that particular thing about the line managers was that actually none of those were, were sort of directly related to you know, sort of superior performance in role. So it's still recognising that there is some value in them, but it's saying that that by itself isn't the determining factor, if you like, of success. So to do like the strength profiling across the business still has value in it. <coughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, the, more, the more I see, the more I'm, I'm sort of sceptical of any profiling thing that is deterministic and says, you as a customer service agent should be this, 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 this and this. Because it's too prescriptive. And, and also it doesn't buy in and recognise the strength that each individual has. Now you can go too far down that and everything becomes about the individual. Um, clearly, there are some um, ways of working that are more successful in different roles. But what the recent research with uh, the University of Hull uh, has, uh, has found is that a more uh, helpful approach is to look at the evolving requirements and then pull out things that you know actually are associated with successful outcomes. And they're not an arbitrary profile that says you should be this shape. It's much more dynamic than that. So if that is the case, what you've got to do is find ways to access the right sort of you know, moving feast of support to be able to help people at the point of need. And that's why there's such an interest in things like what's called micro-learning, picking up learning bites, short, effective ways of learning that doesn't require you to go on a, a sort of two-week residential course with a training provider like Endor, you know, and I'm, I might be shooting myself in the foot here, uh, because it, it's just changing so much the, the sort of learning agenda. Uh, and a lot of organisations are starting to cotton on and try and catch up with that. So it's a, it's a really interesting time for L&D. Uh, so just to say uh, many thanks uh, for today. I do have, as you'd expect on something like this, um, some uh, glorious, lovely copies of highly discounted following the uh, CMI's uh, support uh, of Upskill. And uh, I've certainly enjoyed uh, spending uh, an hour and a half with you all.
Thank you. Thanks for your contributions. Thank you. Thank you.